Many revolutions have had a dramatic impact in our lives. The French Revolution, for example, changed the course of history by replacing absolute monarchies by modern democracies. Closer to my heart, I was born just a few months after a military coup, and I grew up under a dictatorship that took the lives of thousands of people. One of my first memories as a child is walking through the unpaved streets of my hometown with my mom, carrying pots filled with drinking water to take home for the family. While my mother didn't finish elementary school and my dad didn't go to college, they both knew the importance of education. So one day, I remember my mom told me that if I had homework to do, I wouldn't have to do the chores. Little did she know how much advantage I would take of that deal. <laughs> My favorite subject at school was math. I remember falling in love with algebra and geometry, and I remember playing with equations all day and not doing chores. Everyone in my family was thrilled when one day I was awarded the Presidential Scholarship. I was terrified I had to shake the hands of the dictator to receive it. But not all revolutions are political. In fact, many revolutions have their roots in dramatic scientific advances that have also changed our lives, like mine. I remember I was finishing my engineering studies in Chile, and there was this team that came to the US to the Atacama Desert, the Moon Valley, because they wanted to test a robot that they wanted to send to the moon. I was just fascinated by the challenges of being able to build machines that could perceive and navigate the world in the same way we do. And so I moved to Berkeley to do a PhD in computer vision, machine learning, and, of course, robotics, which are the three key ingredients of artificial intelligence. And there, I just had an awesome time developing algorithms for flying helicopters on moving platforms. My move to Hopkins was quite an interesting story. I had applied to many faculty positions in computer science, including Hopkins. And one day, I get an interview from Hopkins Biomedical Engineering, which I hadn't applied for. <laughs> so I arrived to the interview, I'm there with Murray Sachs, uh, and I had to tell him that the last time I had taken a biology class was in high school. Being such a wonderful man as he was, he told me that the revolution of the 21st century was going to be to make medicine a computational science. And he asked me whether I wanted to join that revolution. Humbled by his answer, I joined Hopkins BME. And Murray was right. Fifteen years after our conversation, we are beginning to see the signs of a dramatic revolution in data science. Think about IBM's Watson or maybe Google's AlphaGo, two machines that have beaten the world uh, champions in Jeopardy and Go. Or think about Uber, uh, who is revolutionizing the car industry by having cars without drivers. Or Cortana or Siri, that are allowing us to talk to machines. Or maybe Amazon Go, who is revolutionizing our shopping experience by creating supermarkets that have no lines and no checkouts. But what is enabling these dramatic changes? Well, on the one hand, data is just growing at an explosive rate, from the millions of pictures and videos that you and I take every day to the massive amount of data that maybe astronomers collect to be able to decipher the origins of the universe. Clearly, today's data is too big and too complex to be analyzed by humans. That is where machine learning comes in. 
the goal of machine learning is that you have data and you want to make predictions from that data. So take, for example, a picture and you would like to predict who is in that picture, and in this case is my daughter. So we humans are really good at making those predictions, but computers are not. And so the dream of artificial intelligence is to be able to create machines that have those prediction abilities as we humans do. And to be able to do that, what you do is that you give a lot of training examples with the kind of data that you want and the kind of predictions that you want the machines to make. And then you teach the machine to make its own predictions. Pretty much, to, uh, they learn like a baby would learn how to recognize objects. Now, the roots of my work in computer vision can be traced back to my elementary school years. I remember that my math teacher would come with a gigantic ruler and compass and would just spend hours teaching us about lines and squares and circles. In my research, I use lines to make predictions from data. Suppose that I take all of the pictures of my son. It turns out that they can reasonably be approximated by just a line, of course, in big dimensions. So if I take the pictures of my daughter, then I have another line. And so if you've got pictures of many people, you've got multiple lines. And that insight is the basis for the algorithms, or for one of the simplest algorithms, to organize your own photos. The origins of my work in biomedical data science uh, can be traced back to that conversation with Murray Sachs 15 years ago. Sadly, uh, Murray passed away exactly one week ago. But his dream of making medicine a computational science is more alive than ever. About three years ago, I began working with a company in Belgium called My Diagnostics and with a great team of medical doctors and engineers from EMEC and Hopkins. And the goal is to revolutionize the blood test. So imagine how it works today. You go to the doctor, they tell you you need a blood test, you get it the next day, you get the results the day after, and then you have to go to the doctor again to be diagnosed. What if you had a small device where you could get the results on the spot at the first visit to the doctor. To be able to do that, we need to get some blood, image it in a small device, and then use computer vision algorithms to detect, count, and classify those cells. And that is going to be the next revolution in point-of-care testing. In another project, uh, I'm working with 10 universities to revolutionize information. I'm sure you all know what information is about, and you can tell what's informative from what's fake news. But do you know what information is to a computer? How a computer measures information? Well, if you open your computer, I'm sure you've seen that the files are maybe 10 megabytes or something like that. Well, that's exactly how a computer measures the information in, 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 in data. But that's actually not very useful. Uh, let me give you one example. Suppose or imagine that you have a picture, and that picture has lots of people gathering in front of a supermarket. And suppose that there is a truck that's passing by. Well, that truck could be the truck that killed hundreds of people in Nice two years ago, in which case it's very informative for terrorists. Or it could simply be that the truck is offloading the goods in the supermarket, and in that case it's not very informative. The next revolution in artificial intelligence will be to develop machines that can figure out what's informative in data versus what's not informative. And so for that, we are developing a framework that is going to redefine information so that you can characterize the amount of semantic content in that data set. So this is a little bit like creating a digital Sherlock Holmes. 
The applications of this could be endless. If we could record maybe the activity of all neurons, perhaps we'll figure out the connectivity of the brain. If we could figure out all of the uh, activations and connections between genes, maybe we'll figure out a cure of cancer. Or maybe in 50 years from now, hospitals will have all of the data from all patients in the world. And so when you go to the doctor, there will be a question and answering system that will ask for your symptoms. Then you'll be able to go into a database to search for all patients that had similar symptoms. And then you will figure out what treatment was given and which worked and which didn't. Saving a lot of costs and potentially saving millions of lives. Step by step, as we are forging the future, I cannot help but reminisce about the many revolutions that have changed my own life. Don't be afraid of the revolution that is about to forge your own future. It will change your life in the same way that data science has changed mine. Thank you.